And the church said, Amen. Amen. All right. Well, okay, the lights here, a little different than the chapel. All right, I try to see out there a little bit, see what I'm looking at. Uh, of course, I am not Pastor Dan Shaw, as some of you are well aware, but I'm going to make myself a little more Dan Shaw-like. Hang on here just a second. Okay, now we're going to get busy here. We're going to go a little more Dan Shaw here. Listen, I am uh, Michael Adams, the president of Faith International University and Seminary here in Tacoma, and um, the historic Faith Evangelical Lutheran Seminary, founded in 1969. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> through the years, I have dealt with uh, and trained and equipped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pastors, and I've met their wives, and I, I'm telling you folks here at, uh, at Emmanuel, Dan Shaw is a great pastor. Come on, come on. He's, he's well, well above average. This guy's good, and I get around a lot, and we have a lot of different types of students. I, have a lot of African-American Baptist students, and I get out every now and then, get to preach in African-American Baptist churches, if you can imagine what that's like. And frankly, I hear preaching. I hear preaching. And Dan Shaw is right there. Dan Shaw is a great preacher. He has passion. He has compassion. And I adore his wife, Kim. What a treat she is. Amen. Round of applause for Kim, please. What a great leadership team. So I encourage you, take care of that couple, because they are gold. That is a pastor that can take this church uh, places you didn't even imagine that it could go. It's exciting, exciting stuff. Now, two longtime friends uh, followed me here to Emmanuel. I live in Fircrest. They didn't have to come very far. But they followed me here today. Their, their names are Goodness and Mercy. It appears that according to Psalm 23, they're going to follow me all the days of my, my life. Now, some of you may have heard of me, some probably not. I, I've, again, served as a president of Faith Seminary for the last 13 years, but I've been there for 31 years. Uh, and it, it's been a great ride, a wild ride, but I've met a lot of key people, a lot of pretty famous people. I've been in some pretty interesting situations in my life. Uh, I sat, you know, I've had, I've had dinner with the United States Supreme Court. I had a glass of orange juice with the King of Tonga once a year. I mean, just all kinds of great things. But the best thing you can know about me is that I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's it. Amen? That's really all I would probably ever need to put on my resume. As Charles Haddon Spurden once said, if God hadn't saved me before the foundation of the world, he certainly wouldn't save me now. There's no particularly good reason to do that. Now, I am a happily married man of... Um, 43 years, thank you, and this is my wife, Kim, stand up, please. I, I there, say hi to Kim. <clears throat> she has learned how to put up with me for 43 years, and uh, Dan and I are both smart, we married Kim's, and uh, we discovered the key to uh, happy marriages. We discovered that whenever we discovered, when we first got married, if we ever got in a fight, that I'd go for a walk. And I'm here to tell you after 43 years, the fresh air has been good for me. It's, it's been good. Every, we go to dinner twice a week. Um, candlelight, soft music, slow ride home. She goes Tuesdays, I go Fridays. Uh, <clears throat> to, today we begin a new series. I get to launch this series. And it's called, you saw it on the, on the board as you came in. It says, Long Lay the World. Because this is the beginning of Advent. It's Advent, starting right now, and of course, Long Lay the World is uh, words taken from a, a song, uh, O Holy Night, by the French composer um, Adam Adolf, and translated by John Sullivan Dwight many years ago. And it's a beautiful, beautiful hymn of the church, filled with magnificent theology and doctrine. And of course, this being the, the first Sunday of Advent, it fits perfectly where we're beginning to celebrate uh, the coming of Christ, not the second coming, the first coming, the second coming, but he came in three ways. He came as in the incarnation as the Son of God. He, he, he came into my heart and your heart as Savior, and then he comes again as soon coming King. So long lay the world in sin 
and error pining, that means longing or yearning, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. What is your soul worth? Jesus tells us, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world, that's a whole world, and lose his soul? That's what your soul's worth. What's the world worth? Said the first service, probably a trillion, trillion dollars. The whole world. What would it matter if you gained it all and you lost your soul? Your soul can be lost. He came to find it. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's why you have the scripture today. Isaiah 7.14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's you. God with us. Now, with the advent, with the coming of Jesus, it's personal. God is getting personal and God is about getting personal. One-on-one. Not group therapy. One-on-one. One, as I told the first service, most Sundays I, before church, I go to breakfast and I read the Morning News Tribune, and more specifically, I read the obituary section. And it's not because I'm strange or macabre or into that. I just want to know what are people saying about their lives after they live for 70, 80, 90, 100 years, some younger? What are they saying? What are the last, what's sort of this last little will and testament they want everybody to know about themselves? And it's amazing that, and sadly, that only about two out of ten obits ever say anything about God or Jesus or the the, the church. And most obituaries are replete with the self, what they did, what they accomplished. And and much of it is moral and noble and impressive. Don't get me wrong. It's pretty impressive stuff. I remember sitting by a guy in an airplane one time coming back from a, a conference and he, uh, he began to tell me what he did. He was in the military and uh, had a, an illustrious military career. And I said, well, that's really pretty cool. What are you doing now? Well, now I'm in search and rescue and I just saved three people off a mountain last week and the year before that I'd saved a couple people. I said, my gosh, that's incredible. I've got no stories like that. Man, you are saving lives. And then he says to me, <clears throat> we're across the aisle on a plane, he goes, and if that's not good enough to get me in heaven, <clears throat> then I'm not going to make it. <clears throat> yeah, well, that got me going. So I said, sir, sir. He said, what? I said, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. What do you mean? I said, well, let's, let's take just this little example. Say so you and I, are going to have a long jump contest off the Santa Monica Pier in California. And you go running as fast as you can. I'm first, I go out first. I go, I run, and man, even my tender age, I go out 15 feet off the pier into the water. 15 feet, not bad for an old guy. And he comes behind me and he almost sets a world record. He jumps out 30 feet, twice as far as I got. He's out in the water, 30 feet. He said, yeah? And I said, the problem is the goal is Hawaii. That's how far we're both away. I don't care how good you did, how everything you've done, you're not going to make it on your own righteousness, on your own good deeds. St. Augustine said, you know what he called good deeds? Splendid sins. Good deeds apart from Christ are just splendid sins. Powerful, powerful, powerful. I'm reminded that there are only two groups of people on this planet, and at that time, that guy was one of them. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, he said there are two people, just only two groups. It's not, it's not black, white, male, female. It's two groups, two groups of people on the planet, those who are perishing and those who are being saved. You sit here in one group or the other, as I talk to you today. You either right now are perishing because you don't know Jesus, or you are being saved because you've heard the gospel, you received it, you received him. Amen? It's that simple. Two groups. And in those two groups, you can live three ways. Three ways to live. You can live immorally, apart from God, in debauchery, and you're perishing. You can live morally, apart from God, morally, and be perishing. Or, 
You can live in tr- Christ trusting the gospel and be being saved. That's what it's all about. And I believe the enemy's primary scheme is to get people to live in debauchery, if it can, godless debauchery, but just as heinously loved ones. It's to get people trusting in themselves and their deeds of righteousness. And from all my research on that that latter scheme, people seem to want to do that all the time. I mean, they're members of clubs and organizations, fine, no issue, Odd Fellows, Kiwanis, Masons, Elks, they're always good people who love their family and they love life as I read these obituaries. They were loved by all, not true, no. They loved everybody, not true, we know better than that. But they loved golf, hunting, fishing, they were kind-hearted, they fought the good fight with courage against a disease, and they did and some served in the military, had combat experience, awarded the Purple Heart, they were bus drivers, social workers, educators, civil servants, first responders, lawyers, senators, governors, noble professions, all loved ones, noble. But nothing in the obituary about trusting Jesus. Ah, just heart touching and some incredible resumes in the, in the mind of God, their resume serves only as their, their eulogy. And all of that self-righteousness will equate to an eternal, Separation from God, apparently they didn't need the gospel with its savior, they trusted in their own morality. I told the first service we have a remarkable thing in this country called sociocultural Christianity, and it's an exceedingly dangerous phenomenon, I deal with it all the time. You go to church because it's a cultural thing to do. It's your background, it's part of your community, it's, uh, it's part of your heritage, your history, it's a bit of a social club. Your granddaddy was a pastor, your uncle was a deacon. I remember preaching for the uh, Primitive Baptist in uh, Nashville about a year ago, maybe a couple years, and um, I was heading over to be one of their key speakers. It's an African-American Baptist group, and um, on the shuttle bus over to the hotel, I, five ladies got on with me. It's just me and the five ladies, and there's a grandma, a mother, and her three daughters, and they had just gotten back from New Orleans for seven days. And they had gotten their party on in New Orleans. They had been doing all kinds of revelry in New Orleans, and they were going to tell me all about it. And they told me everything they did, and oh boy, they obviously didn't know my, who I was, but they're telling me all the stuff, and they'd got into this and done that and done that. And then they asked me, so why are you here? <laughs> I said, well, I said, I'm here speaking for the Primitive Baptists. And the grandma says, wow, I grew up as a Primitive Baptist. Yes, you did. You did grow up in church, didn't you? You probably sang in a choir, didn't you? Yeah. But you are not a disciple. You don't know Jesus. That's the problem. That's the problem. The term Christian used to be synonymous with disciple. You say you're a Christian, you're a disciple, a devoted, loyal, obedient follower of Jesus. And if you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian. Seriously, folks, get that through your head. I know Pastor Dan says this all the time. If you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian. Call yourself whatever you want, but you must be a disciple. He's told you this. Christian is used probably three times in the New Testament, one times even in a derogatory fashion. Disciple, 267 times depending on the Translation, you are a disciple of his. You're a follower. You're committed to him. Call yourself Christian, fine, no issue. Call yourself Lutheran, fine, no issue. Even though we don't even know what it means to say some of these denominations anymore. Somebody tells me they're a Lutheran, I don't know what that means. They tell me they're a Presbyterian, I have no idea what they mean. I just know it's probably God's will. That's a joke. Okay, you'll get it on the way home. So I say, are you a Christian? Oh, well, what do you mean? Oh, I go to church. I sing in the choir. I, I serve at the rescue mission. Wrong answers. It's all external. God doesn't want the external you. He wants your heart. He wants your life 24-7. He wants you to get your praise on, your worship on that we just did as much out of church as you do in church. He wants you to live it. I'm thinking of a story here that's uh, where there's a real personal thing that happens. It's a great illustration for how God wants to get personal. It's in Genesis chapter 32, and it deals, it's a story of Jacob and a wrestling match. So let me just read this to you very quickly in, in Genesis 32, starting in 22. 
That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So hear this. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. I mean, it's, it's, it's WWE time. Look here. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was rent, wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you've struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Meaning, you know my name. Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. <clears throat> See, no matter what your pedigree, no matter what your background, God wants to get personal with you. In this text about Jacob, God would say, yes, Jacob, I know. Isaac may be your daddy. Sure. Abraham may be your granddaddy. But Jacob, you have to be right with me because I have plans for you. I've already prophesied that the older will serve the younger. I have plans for you, but you have to be right with me. You've got to get into my plan. I've got to get your attention. And you remember that story as those two boys were born, Esau and Jacob, how Esau came out of the womb and he's the first one out and he's all hairy. And so they named him Harry. That's what Esau means in Hebrew, Harry. And if you can imagine that scene as he's coming out, they're pulling him out, clutching his heel. Here's the second one, the brother, up through the womb, one arm, clutching his heel. And that's Jacob. So they name him Yaakov, or Jacob, which etymologically means God protects, but it sounds in Hebrew like deceiver, conniver, heel grabber, somebody who trips people up. And you remember from the very beginning that Jacob wanted the birthright, that special inheritance, the recognition of son number, number one of the family line. But God's already declared that to happen. He just needs Jacob to relax a little bit and go with the flow, go with God's plan. See, Jacob believed in God, but he didn't believe God. And I ran into so many people. They believe in God, but they just don't flat out believe him. They don't believe his word. So don't fret, fuss, strive. Just believe his word. And you remember when Isaac... The, the, the father is dying. He wants to bless his son. And of course, he's going to bless the older son with the, with the family blessing. And so Isaac's wife, Rebekah, said to Jacob, because she favored him, Jacob, while Esau's going out to hunt, I'll, I'll kill one of the animals right now and pretend that, that you are Esau so that you will get the blessing. So she pops something into the microwave and, and presto, Jacob is, is, is wrapped in animal skins and he takes his stew to Isaac. And three times Jacob lies to his blind, dying father because the father recognized the voice, said to him three times basically, are you Esau? Yes, I'm Esau. Yes, I am. How did you get it so quickly? The Lord provided. Oh, now he's even got God involved in it. Oh, my gosh. In the deception. And after that deception, he's fooled. Isaac's fooled. He gives the blessing to Jacob. Esau, needless to say, was not happy. He finds out. He says, I'll tell you what, Jacob, I'm going to kill you. I am flat out going to take your life. You are done. So Mama sends Jacob away because, remember, Rebecca loved Jacob and Isaac loved Esau. Already got a little family dilemma there. Be really careful with your children. We, all, we love them all the same, right? Right? Okay, okay, don't pick favorites. Very important. That's never worked out well in the Bible. Uh, so he's with Laban for... At least 20 years, of course, you remember the story of Eunice Rachel, this beautiful woman. And remember, Jacob's pretty old. He's probably 70, and he meets Rachel. And again, back in the day, 70 was more like 35 or 40, okay. But he's 70, and he meets a 15-year-old. Now, in our culture, that doesn't look right. But back then, it was fine. And he says, he sees Rachel, and Rachel says she's, she's beautiful with form. Whoa, 
beautiful, that's an interesting Hebrew idiom, beautiful with form. It means, I don't know how else to say it, she's beautiful and put together. I don't know how else would I say it. You, you get my drift? She's not only pretty, she's put together well. And so he falls in love with her and he says, I'll, I'll work with you for seven years and uh, you give her to me and, as my wife. And of course, Laban says, absolutely. And it, you remember what happened on the night? He got married, all dressed in veil. Laban switches out Leah, the homely daughter for the pretty one. And so Jacob wakes up next to, uh-oh, Leah. He's furious. And uh, finally, after a week later, he says, okay, if you go through the wedding week, I'll have you marry Rachel, but you've got to work for me another seven years. And that happens, so for 14 years. But you've got to understand, what does that look like? A week after you married somebody you didn't want to marry, now you married her sister, and now you bring them both into the tent. Wow, that must have been a really happy family Thanksgiving right there. I, I, I tell you, that just doesn't even, it doesn't even sound good. But that's what was going on. A lot of trickery and a lot of debauchery. And the only thing I can say about the, the Rachel story is, listen, without Jesus Christ as number one in your life, you're very liable to wake up next to the person that you didn't think you married. So many times in my counseling, and more husbands and wives said, wow, that's not who I thought I married. I said, well, then you've got to take it to Jesus because he can change that man, he can change that woman. That's the way it's going to work. Bottom line is now, Jacob's sick of the, uh, of the treachery. He leaves, and he knows that Esau's coming with 400 men. He thinks he's going he to kill him. He's not going to do that. Uh, but we come to the drama now. Jacob sends his wife. He sends his children across the river, and it's pitch black. It's completely dark. It's never bad to have a dark night of the soul. It's never a bad thing. It's okay sometimes to be alone with God. And with all of the social media and stuff we have these days, it gets increasingly difficult to do that. He's left alone, and there's a fight before he sees Esau. And it's a preliminary battle. Jacob had always been the aggressor, but now it is the angel of the Lord. It is actually God himself. This is what's known in the Bible as a theophany or a Christophany. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. This is not the baby who's coming, the incarnate Christ. This is the pre-incarnate Christ as a man. And Jacob was left alone as the man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Who is this man? This is God saying, okay, Jacob, finally, you're alone. I'm coming after you. You've been the aggressor. I'm going to be the aggressor. This is God saying, you want a piece of me? I'll give you a piece of me. And he takes him down to the ground. And he wrestles him. In the Hebrew, the root word for wrestle is ya'avik, meaning dirt. Meaning we're down in the dirt. We're wrestling. We're in the dirt. It's getting down and dirty with God. <clears throat> it's WWE time. It's time to go <clears throat> in this corner. <clears throat> you have Jacob. Jacob. Five feet, five inches tall, 145 pounds, soaking wet, reach 34 inches, age 90. Jacob, the deceiver. And in this corner, his height immeasurable, his weight immeasurable, his reach to the stars, his age, the ancient of days, the almighty with abs, the prince of peace with pectorals, the divine with deltoids, the savior with a six pack. This is Jesus in a muscle shirt. Get the picture. This is God saying, I will get down and dirty with you if I've got to. I'm not afraid. I brought you up from the dust. I'll push you back down into the dust if I've got to. And they wrestle, and they wrestle, and they wrestle. And Jacob, even being a mama's boy and working on Uncle Laban's farm for 14 years, he's pretty strong for an old guy. Strong. And he's going to beat Jesus, but only because Jesus is wrestling as a man. And as the sun begins to come up, and Jesus knows that no man shall see God and live. He says, let go of me. Nope. And he says, I tell you what, I'll make you go. I'll just touch you on the hip. It's no power bomb. It's no slam. It's no sudden move. It's just a slight touch on the hip. His socket's out of joint. His legs are gone. He can no longer wrestle. He's helpless. He's hopeless. But what does he do? He cleaves to Jesus. He hangs on. And he says, let go of me. He says, no, unless you bless me, I will not let you go. Wow. Wow. Unless you bless me, I will not let you go. Jacob won't tap out. 
So he goes from wrestling to cleaving. He's willing to risk his life knowing that the one thing he now knows he needs is the blessing of God directly. Jacob says, I won't let you go till you bless me. And God said to him, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. Really? Jacob? Some 20 years ago, your dying father asked you what your name was. Three times he asked you what your name was, and you told him your name was Esau. Who are you, boy? Who are you? I'm Jacob. That's right. You're Jacob. Thank you for admitting that. You're the deceiver. You're the con artist. You're the striver. You're the one that wants to do it all apart from me, but finally, you get it. You're wrestling with God and prevailed. You're hanging on to me. You're knowing that I'm your blessing. And because of that, I'm going to change your name. Your name is no longer Jacob. It is now Israel. We have this new value. And I tell you, your name may be right now anxiety, but let him rename you. If you come to Jesus, your name will be peace. Your name is addiction, come on. Your name can be freedom. Your name is rejection, come on. Your name will be acceptance. Your name is abuse, Jesus says, no, no, no. Your name is now purity. I'm renaming you. As the song said, as we sang earlier, I am who you say I am, amen? I am who you say I am. He changes names. And Jacob is now limping on his way to face his angry brother. He's exhausted. And he's physically unable to fight. And at this moment, there was nothing else for Jacob to do, catch this, but to depend wholly upon God. And the meeting with Esau was not what he expected. As a matter of fact, Esau ran to Jacob, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And you know that phrase? You've heard it before. Where did it? somebody run to a person, fall on his neck and kiss him repeatedly. Where did that happen? In Luke 15, the prodigal. And so when Jesus is telling this story, every Old Testament person would said, well, that's just like Esau and Jacob. Yeah, wow. When he should have killed him, he fell on his neck and kissed him. What grace, what mercy. So we learned a couple things from the story. First, sometimes it's providential to be alone and vulnerable. It's okay to be alone and vulnerable. It's, it's when we're in God's presence that we can totally open up and, and have that vulnerability to know who we really are. And sometimes God will get gritty with you if he needs to. Don't be afraid of that. And the second thing is this. God will not bless who you pretend to be. Hear me. He will only bless who you really are. You hear me? He will not bless who you pretend to be. Only who you really are. That's why he's trying to get Jacob to be the real Jacob. God's not looking for pretenders. Jacob's been a pretender all his life. He's now a contender. And the best thing of all, catch this, for Jacob, God was no longer just the God of Abraham and Isaac. A few verses after the encounter, we read, and Jacob set up an altar there and called it God, the God of Israel, meaning God, the God of Jacob. Finally, it's personal. God's life in us expresses itself as God's life, not as human life trying to be godly. That is, the expression of Christian character is not doing good, but it is God-likeness. Now, I'm going to close with this last thing, one last thing, just a couple minutes, and I do tell you when I'm going to close. I mean it. You've been around pastors tell you you're going to close, and they never do. They kind of try to land the plane about three, four times, but we're, we're with seat backs upright and tray tables locked and seat belts on. Let's bring this thing home. Last thing. <clears throat> I was thinking some time ago about um, the first, what was it that Jesus said as he began his public ministry? And I went back to do a little bit of research on that because I thought, here it is, the, the God of the universe comes all the way across the universe. He's born in a manger. As a human, he grows up at the age of 30, we hear some words that he must be about his father's business when he's a child. And we hear words that he spoke to John the Baptist as he's being baptized. And we hear the words that he spoke to Satan being tempted in wilderness. It is written. But what was it that Jesus said? The God of the universe, when he had a chance to start his ministry, 
And remember the time when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is walking away. Two of John's disciples, one of them being Andrew, decided to follow Jesus. And they're following him kind of awkwardly at a distance. They're just following. And he stops and he turns. And this is what the creator of the universe, these are the first words out of his mouth as he starts his public ministry. <clears throat> he says, What do you seek? Wow. He could have said, I know what I seek. The Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. I know my mission. What do you seek? And that's what I would ask you today. What do you seek? What is it you want? You can go King James and say, what seekest thou? But that's what the God of the universe says. He said, I know what I seek, but I'm asking you. It's, it's now your choice. What, what do you seek? And I hope we say, well, I want to seek God. I, I'm seeking salvation. I'm seeking to be right with God. I'm, I'm seeking to be blessed of God. We, we hope that's it, but some people are seeking riches and fame and fortune and these things that just, uh, just fly by. But there is a right answer. I'm seeking you. Wise men, as the bumper sticker says, still seek him. And we know that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That means he's not a rewarder of those who casually inquire about him. So my goal in life is to diligently seek him. So for Christmas, what do I want? Well, I, I want to seek him. And my best present is I want him to bless me. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So the question I leave you with is what do you seek? What do you seek? My name is Dr. Michael J. Adams, and I approve this message. Thank you. Thank you.